Welcome to Hood War Stories. In this episode, I'll be discussing the Fush Town Mafia Crips. Watts is a neighborhood in Los Angeles, California. It's located approximately seven miles southeast of downtown LA. Historically, Watts sat at a major junction of the rail line. In the area, became home to many black Americans who worked on the trains, and their families included. Today, the demographics in the neighborhood are shifting. It remains an economically challenged neighborhood, where 40% of its residents live below the poverty line. Added to this mix are the 22,000 visitors that come to the Watts Towers each year. Over 50% of visitors to the towers are international tourists. Virtually every block in Watts is claimed by a gang. It easily is one of the highest gang concentrated areas in Los Angeles County. The Fushtown Mafia Crips were originally called the Juniper Jumpers. Juniper Street is considered the heart of their territory on 105th and 107th Street. Locals say Fushtown got their unique name from Watts being a primarily black neighborhood in the 1970s similar to Washington, D.C. being named Chocolate City. Others have said that many of their lanes and alleys in their neighborhood were not paved, and when it rained, it looked like fudge. Their primary color to wear is brown, and it coincides with fudge, but they weren't always Crips. Before they took on the Crip identity, they went by Fudgetown Mafia. When they started hitting the county, they were forced to pick a side. They were one of the last sets of Watts to add Crip to their name. Fudgetown is a small, but violent set, with approximately 76 documented members, 30 of whom which are active. October 5th is considered their hood day. Most LA black gangs have hood days where they celebrate being gang members of a particular neighborhood. Usually, that day is selected based on the street that they affiliate themselves with. In this case, it's 105th Street. Fudge Town's main rivals are the Watts Valley Grape and the Grape Street Crips. These two sets share the Jordan Down housing projects, with the Grape Street Crips being primarily black and Watts Vario Grape being predominantly Latino. Watts Vario Grape and Fushtown's territory are in very close proximity to each other. Until 2008, the Fushtown Mafia Crips had a good relationship with Watts Vario Grape. This all ended on January 17, 2008. Luz was picking up her boyfriend Artie from work. Artie was from Fushtown, who went by limp. Luz, her three-month-year-old daughter, and her 14-year-old niece were also in the car. On the way home, they stopped at a liquor store and Artie bought a bottle of beer. Artie asked Luz to stop at the corner of 107th and Grape so he could socialize with three of his friends. One of these friends, DC, was also a member of Fudgetown. Gilbert then arrived on bike and talked to Artie. Artie talked aggressively and used hand movements. Gilbert left on his bicycle while Artie continued talking with his friends. Gilbert told his brother Derek and Richard that someone wanted to talk to Derek around the corner. They were all members of Watts Barrio Grape and they also were Leonardo's cousins. Gilbert returns to the corner of 107th and Grave Street with several men, including Leonard. Artie began talking loudly and with lots of hand movements. He began challenging people to fight and took off his shirt. At some point, Leonard moved towards Artie. He then fired one shot, then a second shot to the back of Artie's head. Artie's body spun and dropped to the ground. Artie suffered four gunshot wounds. Shots to the back of his head and his back were the fatal ones. Leonard Rocha from Watts Fario Grave was convicted of murder. He was sentenced to 50 years to life. Artie's death caused tension, but not a war. Not until March 2011, when a Fushtown member named Stebo was stabbed by a Watts Vario member. That marked the official kickoff of the war between Fushtown and Watts Vario Grape. On March 26, 2011, Jose from Watts Vario Grape was fatally shot by Fushtown Mafia while he was on the 10600 block of Grape Street. Jose was found in the street with several gunshot wounds. He was taken to a hospital in Linwood, where he was pronounced dead at 8.38 p.m. He was only 16 years old. A few months later, on June 18th, 2011, at around 10 p.m., Emmanuel and Angelica were conversating in the driveway on the 10600 block of Grape Street. A vehicle drives by, and an assault rifle emerges from the window. Bullets start flying, striking Emmanuel and Angelica. Both victims were taken to a nearby hospital and pronounced dead. Emmanuel was a beloved Vario Grape Street member and Angelica was the mother of a newborn baby. The Fushtown Mafia Crips were widely believed to be responsible for the double homicide. Two months later, on August 28, 2011, Reginald, also known as Chuck Wayne from Fushtown, was driving with two other people near 105th and Grape Street. As they were driving, someone standing on the sidewalk began shooting at the vehicle. Reginald was struck in the head and back just after midnight. Authorities discovered Reginald slumped in the driver's seat of his car that had slammed into the tree. He was pronounced dead at the scene. Two passengers who had been in the car and had ran away 
were questioned and released. Juan's Barrio Grape is believed to be responsible for the shooting. A few weeks later, on October 11th, 2011, at around 8.50 a.m., Oscar, also known as Knuckles from Juan's Barrio Grape, was with his aunt Aurelia near 106 in Wilmington. Aurelia was at her tamale stand where she sold her tamales every day. Oscar was standing near the street corner, about eight to 10 feet away. Aurelia's car was between her and the street. Suddenly, two black males emerged with a Glock and a Beretta and began spraying Oscar with bullets. He was shot 21 times. Three gunshot wounds to the back were fatal because they hit his lungs and heart. Three bullets went completely through Oscar's head. Immediately after the shooting, the black males ran down an alley near a market. A paramedic arrived to the scene and found Oscar face down with his upper body on the sidewalk. He checked for vital signs and determined he was deceased. On October 19th, 2011, shortly after 2 p.m., two officers were heading westbound on 104th Street, approaching Graham. They observed a speeding white Buick proceed northbound on Graham Street. After checking the car for warrants, they discovered that his registration had expired. The officers activated their overhead lights and sirens. The Buick did not stop, but continued until it pulled into a driveway of a shopping center. The Buick slowed and the passenger door opened. The officer saw Jamal's foot and then the muzzle of a gun. Jamal leveled the gun, which had an extended magazine at the officers. The officer saw the gun jerking downward about three times. Jamal's gun was pointed at him for about three seconds. By the time the officer got out of the car, Jamal ran off. The officer took off on foot after Jamal. Jamal climbed the fence around in the center and threw the gun over the fence. The officer commanded Jamal to get down, but Jamal did not do so. Jamal went back towards the driveway and crossed the street going southbound. The officer set up a perimeter. Jamal climbed on a roof and officers surrounded the house. About a half hour later, Jamal was detained. Police recovered a gun from the shopping center where they confronted Jamal. On October 19th, 2011, Jamal was placed in a jail cell with a confidential informant. The informant wore a video and audio recorder. Jamal told the informant that he was in for an attempted murder of a police officer. Jamal admitted that he was trying to shoot at the police, but the safety of his gun was on. Jamal had a gun at the time, because early in the day, he seen someone drive by, who he thought might be with Vario Grape. He quickly went home and got a gun. While driving, they went by a yard where there were Pisces. Pisces are Mexicans that were born and raised in Mexico, but are doing business in the United States for money and currently residing there. Jamal claimed he would have shot the Pisces because they associated with members of Vario Grape. Jamal asked the informant if he had heard about the Knuckles murder. Jamal then told the informant that he used a Glock and a Beretta to shoot Oscar. Jamal said he shot Oscar in the head 13 times and Melvin shot the tamale lady in the leg. The informant asked what was up with the Southsiders, meaning Vario Gray. Jamal said, we gonna kill them all. There's only a handful left. Jamal claimed that all the shots at the victim were headshots. He said, I saw his brain spilling out. It's gonna be a close cask of a show. Everyone in the clique that Jamal belonged to had committed a murder. Jamal told the informant, we got a cold little pack. In response to the informant's comment, so is you and little Nifi, huh? Jamal responded, yeah, me and baby Nifi knocked that nigga Knuckles. The next day, the same informant was placed in a cell with Melvin. Melvin bragged that over 20 murders had been committed with the Beretta. He described Oscar's killing as a slaughter rather than a murder. Jamal Lamar King, also known as Badass, and Melvin Lemon, also known as Baby Nefi, were both convicted of the murder. They were both sentenced to 25 years to life, plus 25 years to life for the firearm enhancements. And just to let y'all know, cuz on the set, whoever won't beef with the full out town mafia crib, on the set, we coming home, whoever can get it, on the set, we knocking shit down, killing whoever, whatever, whatever, T gon' ride a gang, everything, killer, badass, the motherfucking myth, the man, the legend, the beast, on crib. On crib, shout out to all them homies and all that, cuz we gon' get out, cuz one day we gon' get out and just ball hard, cuz fuck everything, cuz on riders, cuz baby need for the low, cuz on crib, FIP, big need for enough, tell my nigga Wayne, cuz Wayne, tell my nigga, man, that's on crib, I'm holding it down for y'all. Cause on riders. We waving everything off the map, cuz that's on fuss and we face three bashing from the south to the east like cuz fuck wild radio, fuck baby low cut it for our town mafia. FIP to my nigga Chuck Wayne on the set I does on the dead on me like we 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 go to war with cuz with whoever cuz on the set cuz we wiping shit off the map, cut out the wild radio, they know. In the early evening of June 4th, 2012, Mauro and Liliana were outside their home in Los Angeles with their 14 month year old baby Angel, socializing with friends. Mara was holding Angel. Others present included John, DR, and Javier. John was the only black person there. 
It was around sunset, still light out. Luis, a friend of Maro's, arrived bringing purple shirts with the Honda symbol on them, giving them to anyone who wanted one. John and Maro both took shirts and put them on. John saw a person he later identified as Donald passed by the house, riding a bicycle, wearing a gray hoodie. The hood was off. John made eye contact with Donald and gave him a head nod. John thought Donald was going to say something to him because Donald stopped briefly, but Donald said nothing, merely standing in John's direction for about 20 seconds. Donald then left, riding his bike to the corner and turned right, out of sight. John thought nothing of it, but about two minutes later, he saw Donald a second time, riding in the same direction as before. This time, Donald stopped in front of the house. His feet were on the ground and the bike was between his legs. He struggled to pull a gun out from his hoodie pocket. With his left hand, he pulled out a revolver and began shooting. When John saw the gun, he said, Everybody get down! Two bullets hit Angel in the stomach, and he died while being cradled in his father's arms. Despite the fact that Marl had also been shot in the left shoulder, when the shooting stopped, Donald rode his bike fast toward 107th Street, where he turned left. John and Marl were wearing their purple shirts at the time of the shooting. Maro had recently migrated to the States from Jalisco, Mexico. His friends tried to tell him to take the shirt off because of the gang views in the area, but Maro didn't listen. Numerous eyewitnesses identified Donald from a six-pack photo lineup through a cyber support unit. An officer wrote a search warrant and served it on June 13th, 2012. There, they found that Donald had changed his Facebook name three times. The Facebook information contained many statuses. One status said, if you ain't K, nobody stop putting Ks after your letters. Another status said, two things I hate the most, Mexicans and the police. The police executed search warrants for two locations Donald considered home. One was his mother's house on East Santa Ana, about a block and a half from the crime scene. The other one was on East 109th Street, when Donald was arrested. There was a marking on his left arm that said TFR, signifying T-Funk Riders. The T-Funk Riders clique was small, with roughly 12 to 15 members. At 15, Donald was the only member of his age in that clique. The T-Funk Riders clique is a clique of shooters. There is a small percentage of gang members who are shooters in their set. At this point, the war was still ongoing with at least 30 shootings and seven murders. During the war, there was a meeting between Fudgetown members. Fudgetown members were upset because they believed the police and Mexicans were working together. Fudgetown had a lot of disdain for the police. Donald Ray Dawkins was ultimately found guilty on both counts. He was sentenced to 90 years to life in prison. I'd like to thank you guys for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe.